Peace be upon you. So in last week's episode, we looked at extreme poverty throughout the world in the last 30 years has dropped by 65%. That in the past, 36% of the world population was uh, impoverished under extreme poverty, living under a dollar a day. And today, that's less than 10% of the world population. That's a huge achievement. But despite this, people feel more disenfranchised today than ever. Uh, Inequality is on the rise, and people's satisfaction with their economic status is worse than it was in the past, despite things being better in the aggregate. So the question is, why is that? Why do people feel this way? And something happened to me the other week that I feel like is a good example of this entire predicament that we're seeing. And it has to do with kids. So I got two small kids, and um, I learn a lot from them. The fact is, I feel like they're a micro example of myself and adults uh, when we get older. And so what happened was my daughter, she's in kindergarten, and I picked her up early from school so we can go rock climbing. And it was kind of a surprise. So she's super excited. You know, we're happy we're going rock climbing. And as we're driving there, she says, oh, you know, I'm so excited to go rock climbing. Can I go and get my own pair of rock climbing shoes? Because right now she just climbs in tennis shoes. And I said, you know, I really don't want to spend money on uh, rock climbing shoes because in a couple months you're going to like grow out of them. What if uh, you just borrow whatever they have there? So she gets happy, says, okay, that's good enough. So we get there, we get her shoes, and then we start climbing. And between me and her, we share one chalk bag uh, that you chalk up your hands when you climb. And she said, you know, I really want my own bag. And I said, you know, I'm not going to go and just buy another bag. It's fine. We can just share one. And uh, she got upset and she didn't want to climb. And I said, okay, okay, listen, why don't we do this? Your birthday's coming up and I'll get you a chalk bag for your birthday, your very own chalk bag. And she got excited again. So we started climbing. And then in the middle of climbing, she says, hey, you know, I really don't want to eat dinner at home. There's this Vietnamese restaurant that sometimes we go to after rock climbing that's just across the street. Can we go there instead for dinner? And I was thinking, I said, you know, I already have dinner planned and I'm on the fence and you can tell she's getting upset by this. I said, okay, sure, sure. We can go get uh, Vietnamese food afterwards. So she got excited again and we start climbing again. And then (laughs) two minutes later, she says, you know, I really like it when after we get dinner, uh, if we can get this boba drink, this like sugary drink that she likes. And I thought about it, I said, you know, this is uh, uh, it's kind of my, at my wit's end. And I said, no, 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 you know, we didn't come here to get a boba drink. You know, I already said, committed to all these other things. And uh, I'm going to draw the line there and we're not going to do it. And she got really upset and then she didn't want to climb anymore and said she wanted to go home. And I was thinking about this. I said, this is really strange. You know, prior to me picking her up, she was just having a regular day. And then I surprise her with rock climbing. She gets super excited. And now because she can't have... Uh, this boba drink, she can't enjoy rock climbing. And why is that? You know, what is it about the situation that made her more miserable, despite the fact that she had more, is the fact that she was thinking of what she was missing, rather than being appreciative for what she had. And that was the fundamental truth. And this is something that isn't just towards children. This applies to all of us. Uh, The behavioral economist, uh, Dan Ariely, he ran this experiment And what he asks, he says, hey, I have two options for you, an all-inclusive paid trip. One is to Rome. Everything is paid for, your flight, your hotel, your breakfast, it's all taken care of. Or the other option is an all-expense paid trip to Paris. And again, everything is paid for, your flight, your hotel, uh, your, uh, your breakfast, with the exception, no coffee on the Paris trip. You have to buy your own coffee. And what's interesting is this variable of no coffee, that your coffee was not paid for, skewed people towards the trip to Rome versus Paris. When you think about it in the aggregate, what does that even matter? If your coffee's paid for or not, you get this uh, all-inclusive paid trip to this destination. You should be more interested with the fact, are you going to Rome or Paris? Not the fact, is coffee included or not? Because in the grand scheme of things, it's so trivial. But this is the way our mind works. We're constantly thinking about what we're lacking rather than being appreciative for what we have. And if we can learn to be appreciative for what we have rather than unappreciative for what we don't have, then a lot of these ailments, a lot of these reasons that we complain would be eliminated. No different than my daughter who says, look, she's excited because she can go rock climbing. But rock climbing without boba is something that was frustrating for her, made her not want to go rock climbing. When in actuality, the simple act of going rock climbing should be an enjoyment in itself. But again, we as human beings, we get fixated on what we don't have. And one of the problems is that we're constantly comparing ourselves upwards. We're comparing ourselves to what we don't have rather than looking at what it is that we have. 
And this is causing all kinds of ailments and feelings of inequality and injustice in society. Because in the past, when you would compare yourself uh, against your peers, you're comparing people within your town, your class, your immediate peers, and the disparity wasn't all that much. But now we're inundated with celebrities and billionaires and people with a lot of status and fame, and we're comparing ourselves with them as if they're one of our peers. So rather than comparing myself against the top student in my class, I'm comparing myself against the top performer in the world. You know, individuals that used to compare their job compared to, again, their peers, now they're comparing against Mark Zuckerberg. And this is a fundamental flaw because look, in a society, there's always gonna be better uh, people who are gonna have it better than us. But if we're constantly just upping ourselves in the sense of our comparable to determine our happiness, we're gonna be left miserable. Because above everyone, there's going to be someone with more. This is just the way the the system is designed. And this is per God's design. God tells us that he's made us different statuses, different ranks in life, in order for us to serve one another. In 43.32, it says, Are they the ones who assign your Lord's mercy? We have assigned their shares in this life, raising some of them above others in ranks in order to let them serve one another. The mercy from your Lord is far better than any material they may hoard. In a system, especially a free system, where we can each, in essence, work hard to improve our life status, there's going to be some who have more than others. Some people are going to be born into more than others. But this doesn't mean that what we have is any less significant. God has given each of us exactly how much we deserve and uh, how much we can handle. And this is for us to be appreciative. We're constantly, when we judge ourselves, our well-being, our uh, status against that of others, we're going to be miserable because there's always going to be someone who has more than us. In Surah 17 verse 21, it says, Note how we preferred some people above others in this life. The differences in the hereafter are far greater and far more significant. You know, as the global market, global, global GDP grows, the wealth of individuals is going to grow as well. Therefore, there's going to be people with way more money today than there was historically in the past, strictly because the economic pie has increased. And if we're constantly comparing ourselves against others in the sense of how well we're doing, how satisfied we are, then it's a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for being unappreciative. And the reality is vanities of this world, material possessions, cars, status, fame, these do not correspond with happiness, with satisfaction in life. The other week we looked at people who had millions, billions, fame, everything, but they were miserable. They were on the verge of suicide. They were absolutely depressed. They were addicted to drugs and all kinds of vice in order to try to get out of this rut. In Surah 3 verse 196 says, Do not be impressed by the apparent success of disbelievers. They only enjoy temporarily, then end up in hell. What a miserable destiny. So we think that these people, because they have more, is reason for us to be upset. And this is the problem in society, is that we cannot be content with what we have. We're constantly comparing ourselves to others and forgetting the fact that God has tremendously blessed us by giving us life, by giving us the hearing, the eyesight, the brains, all these things that we have for free that we didn't have to work for. And instead, we compare ourselves against the vanity success metrics of others. And God tells us the people who pursue that in this life are going to end up miserable in this life and in the hereafter. In Surah 6, verse 44, it reads, When they thus disregard the message given to them, we open for them the gates of everything. Then, just as they rejoice in what was given to them, we punish them suddenly, and they become utterly stunned. The wicked are thus annihilated. Praise be to God, Lord of the universe. God is saying that those who choose this fleeting life, who choose the vanities of this world, God is going to open the doors for them for everything. They're going to feel like they're on top of the world. But then when it all comes crashing down, that devastation is going to be astronomically more than someone who didn't have that. You know, the example is you take someone to the tallest, uh, the highest level in a floor in a building, and then they're thrown out the window, right? Up until that ride, that moment, it seemed great. And then when reality sets that what they chased for in this entire life has been nothing but an absolute illusion, that devastation is going to hit them harder than they can imagine. God gives us the example of Karun, the slave driver. In Surah 28, verse 76, says, Karun, the slave driver, was one of Moses' people who betrayed them and oppressed them. We gave him so many treasures that the keys thereof were almost too heavy for the strongest band. 
His people said to him, do not be so arrogant. God does not love the arro- uh, those who are arrogant. You know, here's a person who has so much wealth at the time that if you took a group of people to lift up just the keys to his treasure, they couldn't lift them up. This is the immense wealth that was given to them. And it continues in 2877, it says, use the provisions bestowed upon you by God to seek the abode of the hereafter without neglecting your share in this world. Be charitable as God has been charitable towards you. Do not keep on corrupting the earth. God does not love the corruptors. He said, I attained all this because of my cleverness. Did he not realize that God had annihilated before him generations that were much stronger than he and greater in number? The annihilated transgressors were not asked about their crimes. You know, this individual thought that he achieved all this because of his cleverness, that he was so cunning, such a good savvy business person, that this is the reason he had the wealth and didn't realize that God was testing him. God gave him all this. He led him on to confirm his sinfulness. In 2879, it continues, one day he came out to his people in full splendor. Those who preferred this worldly life said, oh, we wish that we possess what Karun has attained. Indeed, he is very fortunate. And then it continues in 80, it says, As for those who were blessed with knowledge, they said, Woe to you! God's recompense is far better for those who believe and lead a righteous life. None attains this except the steadfast. So what ends up happening to Karun? We read in 2881, it reads, We then caused the earth to swallow him and his mansion. No army could have helped him against God. He was not destined to be a winner. Those who were envious of him the day before said, Now we realize that God is the one who provides for whomever he chooses from among his servants and withholds. If it were not for God's grace towards us, he could have caused the earth to swallow us too. We now realize that the disbelievers never succeed. If we chase the vanities of this world, if we compare ourselves against people who have a lot in this life, then we're missing the mark. What really matters is our righteousness, our good deeds, our virtues. We gave the example that when someone reads a eulogy, the aspect of a life that they highlight is all the good deeds this person did. How did this person impact the people in their lives for the positive? This is what matters. This is what we carry with us to the hereafter. These aspects of fame, status, you think about this, you take the the wealthiest person from a thousand years ago. Does anyone even know their name? Does anyone know what the, who they were, what they had? And even the possessions they had are trivial in today's standards. You know, these things that they, they spend so much of their life chasing after is nothing more than an illusion. In Surah 57, verse 20, God gives us this example. It says, Know that this worldly life is no more than play and games and boasting among you and hoarding of money and children. It is like abundant rain that produces plants that pleases the disbelievers. But then the plants turn into useless hay and are blown away by the wind. In the hereafter, there is either severe retribution or forgiveness from God and approval. This worldly life is no more than a temporary illusion. Everything that in this world that we try to achieve, the vanities, they're all going to go to waste. They're all going to turn to dust. Nothing is going to survive. You know, the expression that when you die, your jacket won't need any pockets because there's nothing of this world we're going to carry with us to the hereafter. What matters is our character, our appreciation, the good deeds we do in this life. This is what we're going to carry. This is what our soul consists of. The individual who gets fixated on the metrics of this world and compares their success based on the metrics, these vanity metrics of others, is not only going to be disappointed in this life, they're going to be disappointed in the hereafter because they're chasing an illusion. Now, in the Bible, there's a parable uh, from Jesus in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 through 30, about the parable of the talents. So talents is a currency metric used at the time of the uh, Romans at the time of Jesus. And it reads, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability, and he went away. He who received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who received that one single talent went and dug a hole into the ground and hid it his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have five more talents for you. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful for over a little. I will set you over much. 
enter into the joy of your master. And he who had two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So these individuals, one was received five talents, one received two talents. And they went and they invested. They, they grew this amount to more. And they pleased the master when he came back. And it continues in verse 24. It reads, He who received that one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your one talent in the ground. Here you have, it's yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents." For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness in that place where will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, what is the, the meaning of this parable? Right? It's interesting that the word that's used, talents, right, is multi-meaning. It could mean a currency, but it's also, think of it in the sense of an ability. God has given each of us abilities, gifts, things that we can use to better ourselves. If we get fixated on what others have because we feel like we have less and we don't use these gifts that God has given us, what does that say about what God can trust us with? You know, the person that God has given a lot and they utilize that gift, they utilize it to, to grow economically, to God willing be able to do more good, serve more people, give more charity, is better than someone who reserves these gifts and doesn't use them, right? Keep in mind, in this parable, never was it asked in respect to what the master gave to the other servants. To each was given their own to what they could handle. And that individual could not even handle one talent, let alone five or two, right? This is what it comes down to. Each of us is blessed with certain abilities, certain gifts, certain provisions. The question is, how do we use these to better our situation? How do we use these to God willing draw closer to God? In Surah 42, verse 27, it reads, If God increased the provision for his servants, they would transgress on earth. This is why he sends it precisely measured to whomever he wills. He is fully cognizant and seer of his servants. To each person, God has given specific provisions to see how we react, how do we behave. If God gave us more than we can handle, we might become unappreciative. We might become greedy. We might become uh, hoarding individuals. We get fixated on the world, the vanities of this life. God gives us the example in Surah 7 verse 169. It says, subsequent to them, he substituted new generations who inherited the scripture. That's us. That's me. That's you. And it continues, but they opted for the worldly life instead, saying, we will be forgiven. But then they continue to opt for the materials of this world. Did they not make a covenant to uphold the scripture and not to say about God except the truth? Did they not study the scripture? Certainly the abode of the hereafter is far better for those who maintain righteousness. Do you not understand? You know, we think that because God is most gracious, most merciful, that, oh, if we chase the vanities of this world, it's going to be okay. God's going to forgive us. But we're doing this at the detriment to our own souls. The only thing that's going to give us satisfaction in this world and in the hereafter is God. If we forget that, if we mistake that, then we're only going to be chasing something that's going to leave us thirsty for more. In a previous podcast entitled Satisfaction, we read Surah 53 verse 48, and it reads, He is the one who makes you rich or poor. And this word rich and poor in Arabic, it means to either be satisfied or unsatisfied. That God is the one who's the only individual who can leave us with true satisfaction. If we chase anything else, we're going to be disappointed in that. In Surah 40, 74 verse 6, it reads, Be content with your lot. And in the Arabic, if you break this down, it says, Do not confer favor in order to get more. Meaning that if you're thinking you're going to do good deeds, righteousness, in order so you can achieve more material vanities of this world, we're missing the point. In Surah 76, verse 8, it says, They donate their favorite food to the poor, the orphan, and the captive. We feed you for the sake of God. We expect no reward from you, nor thanks. 
These good deeds we do has to be strictly for the sake of God, to be rewarded by God. Now, if God chooses to reward us in this life with the material possessions, that's fine. But the aim has to be in the sense of gaining righteousness from God. In Surah 92 verse 17, it reads, Avoiding it will be the righteous who gives from his money to charity, seeking nothing in return. What we do in this life has to strictly be for the sake of God. In Surah 2 verse 272, it says, You're not responsible for guiding anyone. God is the only one who guides, whoever chooses to be guided. Any charity you give is for your own good. Any charity you give shall be for the sake of God. Any charity you give will be repaid to you without the least injustice. We do good deeds. We gain in righteousness. We try to gain status, prominence, whatever. It's all for the sake of God, to draw closer to God. We don't do these things in order to be able to be exalted in this world because we realize that this is meaningless. It is not going to give us the true satisfaction we deserve. If we trust in God and God's system, that is the only thing that's going to give us true satisfaction. Once we truly realize this, then God willing, we will stop comparing ourselves to the material success of others and we'll start learning true appreciation. And this is more valuable than anything of this world. One can have everything in the world, but they will not be able to be satisfied. Therefore, they will not be able to be appreciative. Therefore, they will never be happy. And what's more important than your eternal happiness in this world and in the hereafter? God tells us the example in 391. It says, those who disbelieve and die as disbelievers, an earth full of gold will not be accepted from any of them. Even if such a ransom were possible, they have incurred painful retribution. They will have no helpers. We saw that this word kafar, it means to disbelieve, but it also means to be unappreciative. Those who are unappreciative in this world, who never learn appreciation, never learn to be thankful for what God has given them, who are always dissatisfied in this life, they will be dissatisfied for all of eternity. Now imagine being unappreciative and dissatisfied for all of eternity. That is hell. So this is the fundamental problem that we have, why we feel there's so much inequality, why we feel so much injustice, that despite in aggregate things being economically better for the vast majority of people in this world, because we compare ourselves upwards and because there are more wealthy people now than there's ever been in history, we feel more disenfranchised rather than being appreciative for what God has given us. And if we learn this true appreciation, learn to be thankful for everything God has given us and stop focusing on what we don't have, then by God's leave, we can actually attain perfect happiness. God willing, we're going to end there. If you guys got comments or questions, please hit us up at crontalk at gmail.com. And until next time, peace and God bless.